So we're in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. And Chris is telling me I need to slow down a little bit. He's talking about how quick I've been burning through this thing. <laughs> so we're in a Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 17, which is the remainder of chapter 12. And uh, like I said before we got started, really, it's been a couple weeks since we've been on our Wednesday night Bible study. So um, we'd have been through, I'm sure, brother, with... If we'd have preached the last two weeks, we'd probably be through chapter 12 by now. Well, well maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so, uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 13. <laughs> Revelation chapter 12, verse 13 says, And when, I, when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen? Good. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we do pray that you'd bless the service today, Lord, and we do pray that you'd, uh, your Holy Spirit has to be the instructor. Lord, I, can, I can't teach this stuff with any level of, of uh, confidence that it, that it would teach what you want. So, Lord, we ask the Holy Spirit that it put a watchman at my mouth. Would I'd say the things that are pleasing to you. And God, that we just all learn and grow in grace and learn to love you and learn the power of this word that you've given us, Lord, and, and learn to appreciate it with even a greater appreciation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this uh, little section of scripture brings us to the end of the book of Revelation chapter 12, which means that we're solidly more than halfway through the book of Revelation. Amen only been a year that we've been doing it and we're halfway through so we're, we're making good time and uh, I remember when I was first starting teaching Revelation <laughs> I'm gonna pick on my I love picking on you brother Monty Monty got me off to the side and said we're not seminary students pastor you don't have to go into that kind of depth and I got to think about it I said well yeah because there's no seminary class that would take this long on the book of Revelation <laughs> they got to get through the Bible in seminary amen they can't take a year on one book, and at the rate that we're going, it looks like it might be two years on one book, amen? But this is good stuff, and uh, if you look at this thing, you'll see that uh, Satan absolutely hates Israel. Now, the woman's Israel, amen? I yep. just do a little bit of refresher on this thing. The woman's Israel, and uh, Satan absolutely hates Israel. Now, you don't have to be a Bible scholar or even look in your Bible to recognize that fact. If you just look at what's happened to Israel over the history of this world, and you can't figure out that Satan doesn't like that group of people none too much, then uh, you haven't given it much consideration. I, I would have to say that you've put your head in the sand and said, I'm not a Jew, so it don't matter to me. But uh, Israel's gone through it. Yes. And... Uh, I was a little bit surprised, I don't know if you remember, but a couple, two or three weeks back, I preached a message where I talked about the most persecuted religion or the most perse persecuted people on the earth right now are Christians, mm -hmm. professing Christians, which is kind of a term because it's always been Israel. Yeah. Uh, Israel's always been the most persecuted. I mean, if you look at the, uh, the workings of the UN, and if you don't know what UN stands for, it stands for usual nothing. They don't accomplish anything. But if you look at the UN and, and their um, stern um, chastisement towards countries, Israel gets slapped by them more than any other country in the world. As a matter of fact, uh, one time I had the numbers, it was like Israel had been, been uh, <coughs> sanctioned like 230 some times and, yeah. and the next closest was only like four times. I mean, it was ridiculous. And so... You know, if you look at the countries that have issues with human rights, such as Russia and, and, uh, and China and, and um, the Middle East countries especially. I mean, the Middle East countries, if you don't 
go with their religions, they, do, they have a solution for that. They just cut your head off. You know, Christianity's never been that way. Unfortunately, a lot of the world looks at Christianity that way because they look at some of the things that other churches did in the name of Christ, but that's not a Christian movement. The Inquisition was not a Christian movement. The, uh, the, the killing of people that don't believe the way you believe, that's not Christian. You never see an example of Paul saying, well, you heretics refuse to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore I'm going to wage war and kill y'all. No, he prays for him. Prays for him. Amen? So uh, Satan hates history. And his hatred comes from the fact that God promises this world that we're living in. Where does a Christian go when he dies? Heaven. To heaven. Israel's going to get this world. This world was promised to Israel. And that's one of the reasons that Satan hates Israel so much. Because he right now is the God of this world. This world is his. Uh, God's will is not being done on this earth right now. You know, people say, man, I look at the things that happen in some of these schools where kids are being shot and all that stuff. How can God do that? If, he, if, he's, if, he, if, if he's in control of everything, how does he let that happen? They took them out. Well, they did take them out of the schools, amen, but, but still. And the answer is real simple. God allows everybody to have free will, including Satan, including the demonic angels. They all have free will. God didn't want to create a bunch of robots that just worshipped him because that's the way they were programmed. He, he wants to be worshipped. He wants to be acknowledged. But he wants you to do it out of a willing heart. So you see Bible verses say, you know, uh, that God loves a cheerful giver. You know, and, I, and I've preached before, you know, you're supposed to give cheerfully. If you can't give cheerfully... Give anyway. <laughs> Pretend that you're cheerful. But, but fake it until you can make it. Amen? Because if you don't give what you're supposed to give, God says you're stealing from him. So you're getting an income now, brother. We need to check up on it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I never check up on anybody because I don't want to have any bad feelings towards anybody. That's between you and God, not between you and me. You don't send out invoices? No, sir. And I don't ask you for you bringing your tax return so I can see what your income was. Amen. <laughs> There's churches that do that. There's yeah. churches that do that. So uh, <clears throat> if you remember when the Lord taught his apostles how to pray, and they call it the Lord's Prayer, even though that's not the Lord's Prayer. That was his example of how to pray. But in that example, he said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. His kingdom's not here yet. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. His will's not being done on earth right now. That's why the prayer says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because it's not being done. So, when you see all the nonsense going on in that world, God's not behind that. God let his creation have free will and they made bad choices and eventually God's going to come down and set it right. Amen. And King Jesus is going to rule. But Satan is the God of this world. Look at 2 Corinthians. Keep your finger in Revelation. <clears throat> We're going to look at quite a bit of Bible tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of his glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The God of this world is Satan, and he's blinded the eyes of folks who don't believe. And you say, man, I don't understand it. I, I gave a... a the plan of salvation so clearly to this friend of mine or to this relative of mine, I showed it to him so clear... And yet, they didn't choose Christ. And I don't, I, I'll tell you, I don't understand that. The first time I had the gospel presented to me clearly, I was all over that thing. I knew I was headed to hell. Amen. I was all over and saying, God save me. God save me. I'm a miserable person. Look at uh, Jeremiah chapter uh, 33. Jeremiah chapter 33 and uh, verse 8. 
This is God talking about Israel, and he says, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity whereby they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. God's going to clean up Israel, you know, scrub them all up, get them all clean, and he's going to give them this world. He's going to give them this world. Look at uh, uh, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, and, and uh, we'll start with verse 5. It says, Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Paul sometimes wrote things that were kind of tongue twisters and hard to get your head around them. But it's still good stuff. Verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and, their, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. You know, sometimes I preach and I say, This Bible is a bear trap. And I've had, my son even chastised me over that one time saying, how, how can you say that, Dad? You're a preacher and you're saying the Bible's a bear trap. Well, it is. Look at what he just said. Let their table be a snare and a trap and a stumbling block. God's going to let, he's going to confound the wise with their own wisdom. Yes. Amen? Amen? You think you get too smart for God and God's going to say, oh, you want that? Okay, go ahead and believe it. Let that be your reality. And you know, reality, something about re, uh, a, a perception, perception's real to whoever perceives it, whether it's accurate or not. <laughs> perception becomes your reality, and it may not be an accurate thing. And so, verse 10, let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Talking about Israel. God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them, the Jews, to jealousy. God's not done with Israel. Now, God knew Israel was going to fall, and it was part of his plan for Israel to fall, but Satan didn't know that. Satan thought when Israel fell, that's proof that I can be, win this thing. It's proven that I can overcome God because I caused his chosen people to fall. Amen? Amen. Verse 12, now the, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminution of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So God's not done with Israel. He's going to give them this world when it's all said and done. And um, so this verse in Revelation 12, if we go back there, is one of those passages, not just this verse, but this passage, is one of those passages where people teach you can lose your salvation. And... Um, the verse is very specific when talking about those who are saved. There are two requirements in this portion of Scripture. Have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the second one is to keep the commandments of God. Does that sound like grace? Nope. <laughs> keep the commandments of God. And so I'm going to make something real clear because I've never made any bones about it. If you read your Bible and you read it through cover to cover, guess what? You're going to see verses that tell you you can lose your salvation. They're in there, but they're not talking to you. <laughs> you know, if I get a piece of mail and I open it up and it says that I owe somebody $30,000 and I have a heart attack and by the time Lisa revives me and we look at it, it's somebody else's mail. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Now, the Bible has things that are written to specific people in specific times. And so in the, in the uh, tribulation, you can lose your salvation. You can get saved and lose it. In the Old Testament, you could lose your salvation. You could get saved and lose it. In the New Testament church age, you can't lose it. By doing what God told them to do. By doing the sacrifices that they were commanded to do and following the word of God and doing what they were told to do. God knew they weren't sinless, so he gave them a provision. You take a, a goat without, or a goat or a lamb without spot, without blemish, you bring it to the priest on the set time and you sacrifice the, the lamb for your sins. 
And that's how they got saved. So their salvation was a salvation of grace. Everyone, listen, nobody gets saved without grace. It takes grace to be saved because you don't deserve it. Nobody deserves it. But in the Old Testament, it took grace and works. You had to do the things that God told you to do. In the New Testament, for by Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not a, it, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, if you could work and be good enough to get to heaven, you'd have bragging rights when you got to heaven. Hey, I didn't need Jesus Christ. <laughs> I did it on my own. And so you have songs in the secular world, I did it my way. Well, if you did it your way, you're going to hell. Amen. That's right. You can't do it your way. You've got to do it God's way. That's right. Amen? Amen? So, <clears throat> in some of the verses that talk about you losing your salvation and preachers that teach it, you can lose your salvation, you have to distort the, the verse to prove that a Christian can lose their salvation. And before we get to that point, let's clear up this current section of Scripture. The account of Revelation is not talking to church-age Christians, is it? No. Where are the Christians? They've been raptured out. Yes. The church age is over. We're now in the Great Tribulation. So when the book of Revelation is talking to somebody, it's talking to a tribulation saint. Amen? Amen. So why are we studying the book of Revelation, Pastor? Because you need to know. And we're going to look at why we do this, because we're going to go into a little bit about reading other people's mail. You know, stuff that doesn't really apply doctrinally to you, but it's still important for you to know it. Amen? So, the account of Revelation is not talking about church-age Christians. The Christians were raptured. So, let's look quickly. I'm not going to teach a lesson on dispensational truth, but let's take a real quick look at dispensational truth. In the church age, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're born again. John chapter 3, amen? Nobody in the Old Testament was born again. And they never will be born again. Their life has passed and it's gone. And, and they weren't born again and they won't be born again. They're different. You know, when you read your Bible, you'll see phrases like the bride, the bridegroom, friends of the bridegroom. Ooh, there's a different group of people that aren't the bride. And they're not the bridegroom. Who's the bride? Church. The yeah. church is the bride of Christ. Amen. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus. 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 Amen. So there's a friend of the bridegroom. Jesus. Potential saved people. And there's other classifications. I'm, I'm not teaching a lesson on that right now. But there's other classifications that are put in that picture and typology that shows that there's different classes of people. There's the Jew. There's the Christian. There's the tribulation saint. The tribulation saint, you see an example of those and those virgins that had their lamps, amen? Some have them all trimmed and ready to go and some weren't ready. And the ones that weren't ready, what happened to them? They got locked out. They got locked out and cast into outer darkness, amen? So, nobody in the Old Testament was ever born again. They never will be born again. In this age, the church age, when you get born again, you become part of the body of Christ. And you say, well, wait a second, I thought we were the bride of Christ. When flesh joins flesh, those two become one. Amen? Amen. And uh, we just talked about that a little bit in the marriage ceremony. We didn't talk about flesh joining flesh, but we talked about two becoming one. Amen? And therefore shall a uh, man leave his mother and father, and they two shall be joined together and become one flesh. So nobody in the Old Testament or in the tribulation become part of the body of Christ. It's a different group. It's a different subset of people. Amen. When you get born again in this age, the Holy Spirit of God comes into you and spiritually circumcises you from the body of your flesh and then baptizes you into the body of Christ. You know that section of scripture, the, the word of God is sharper and more, and more powerful. Or the word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword dividing it asunder, separating the, the joints from the marrow. That's talking about that spiritual operation that God does when he comes and he cuts your body and your, your soul and your spirit. He separates them. And so Paul says, now when I sin, it's no longer me that sins, my spirit or my soul. But it's his body. And so when you die, your spirit and soul, if you're a Christian, goes to heaven. Amen? Amen. What happens to your body? Satan gets to play with it. 
becomes worm food. Amen? And it doesn't matter whether they embalm you or whatever. And then God's going to give you a new body. Because this old body has the sin on it. And it won't get to heaven. Amen? So, there's no indication that this ever happens to an Old Testament saint or to a tribulation saint. They, they didn't get their soul and their spirit separated from their body. That's why they could lose their salvation. Amen? Amen. So this kind of brings us back to the false teaching that in all dispensations, everybody say it saved the same exact way. That's a false teaching. It's, it's brought upon by false prophets. What does our memory verse say? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And so when these folks come and they teach to you that everybody got saved the same, I, you know what, I love the guy that led me to Christ. He's, he was a preacher by the name of Ronnie Roach out of uh, Great Falls, Montana. And uh, I went to Ronnie Roach because I, when I got saved, I started reading my Bible right away, which is a good sign that you really got saved. Somebody gets saved and they don't do anything for God, don't do it. you got to wonder whether they really got saved or not. But I was reading my Bible and I kept coming across verses of the Old Testament and stuff. And I went to Ron and I said, how... Did somebody before Christ get saved? And he said, brother, they get saved the same way we do. They get saved by looking back to the, or they got saved by looking forward to the cross. We get saved by looking back to the cross. As a young Christian that didn't know anything, I accepted that. I said, oh, okay, that makes sense. But it's not true. They couldn't look forward to the cross. They didn't even know what a cross was. In the Old Testament, crucifixion didn't even come be become a form of punishment until probably about 200 years before Christ was crucified. And it was put together by the Romans. And so people say, uh, anti-Semitic say Jews are those Christ killers. You know who killed Christ? The Romans. We did. Yep. Christ had to die because of you and me. We're the Christ killers. We killed Christ. If it wasn't for us, he wouldn't have had to lay down his life. I was the only man he would have died. Amen. He would have given his life for you. If you were the only person on earth, if you were the only sinner, he still would have given his life for you. Amen. Pastor, indigenous peoples in parts of the world that have never been touched, can they achieve salvation by realizing there's an empty spot in them and going to... In my experience, and, and I'm limited to my experience, and that, as a preacher, you get asked that question a lot. What about the heathen in Africa? To which I always respond, what about the heathen in America? There's people in America that have really never heard a true message of salvation. Lisa never heard one until she was in her 40s. 40s. And uh, there's people who never heard a clear message of salvation. They're, they're religious. They've gone to a church that gives them religion, but it doesn't give them salvation. And so my... Amen. Without the Holy Spirit. But you know what? God is in tune to every human's heart. And it doesn't matter whether they're in the heart of Africa or whether they're in Brooklyn or whether they're in Alamosa, Colorado. That's why you have a conscience. He gives you a conscience, but God's in tune to your heart. He's not necessarily in tune to your conscience. And when you and your heart say, there's something more to this than what I've got, and I know that I'm in trouble because of the way that I've lived. I don't know what that answer is. God will send somebody with the answer in your path. There isn't, I mean, there's a verse that all will and everybody, and the Bible says that everybody already, that the gospel has already gone around the whole world. And the Bible says that there will be nobody that has an excuse because everybody will have the opportunity to be saved. And so I don't waste a whole lot of my energy worrying about the heathen in Africa. If you're asking if they're innocent, no, they're not. If you're asking if they're saved because they never heard the gospel, no, they are not. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. You have to call on the name of Jesus. But if you want, and you know what? I've heard testimonies of, from missionaries that have gone to the jungles of, of some of these third world countries, not necessarily just Africa, but when they get there, somebody will come to them and say, I knew there was something, and I've been asking, saying it, Whoever's out there, if I'm missing something or whatever, in the best way they know how, calling out to God saying, I need to know the answer, and now a missionary shows up. Now there's other people in that village that didn't care. 
They never asked for anything, and they never got anything because they never asked. Like some people in Chicago. Like some people in Chicago or some people in Alamosa. Amen? So it's a false teaching saying that they look back, that they look forward to the cross. Uh, the, it's a false teaching. Noah was saved by faith. Amen? No, he was saved by water. He wasn't saved by faith. He was saved by water. He was saved by grace and water. Now, some of you, with me making that statement, some of you should be saying, well, wait a second, preacher. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and he did. We had faith to build the boat. That didn't take faith. That took backbone. You know, as I'm back here working on the back of this church, it doesn't take a lick of faith to put up a wall. Well, he believed what God told him. He believed what God told him, but he was just being obedient. He was doing what God told him. And that gave him obedience. And so he had works, he had grace, and he had water. He had water. So the Bible does say that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. Just a couple of books back there from the book of Revelation. 1 <coughs> Peter. Peter chapter 3, look at verse 20. Which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited on the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. They were saved by water. That's what the Bible said. Verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when you read that, do you see water baptism? The water dogs do. Who are the water dogs? Church of Christ. Folks that believe that you have to be baptized to be saved. Now listen, you're supposed to get baptized after you get saved, but it's not a prerequisite to salvation. You're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, not by any water baptism. So that's talking about baptism, but it's not talking about water baptism. Could you read that again? Which one? The 21? Uh, granted, I'm, I'm in a perverted manual, but it says, in corresponding to that, verse 21. Oh man, I don't even want to hear that. <laughs> verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, so it's not you're not getting your you're not getting cleansed by baptism, mm -hmm. but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of you're saved by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that is not talking about water baptism. Remember when uh, Will and Zeke and oh, okay. and Davina and and uh, and um, and, uh, and uh, Danielle got baptized, I preached a message on seven different baptisms in the Bible. Yet the Bible says there's one baptism. Which, what, what is the one baptism? Of the, Holy Ghost. the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about water baptism. I, I apologize, I misread it. Okay. I misread it. So it says Noah and his family were saved by water. And before we leave this, it clearly says baptism is what saves us. In verse 21, amen? But not water baptism. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so, now, right here in the book of Revelation, there's three verses that teach you can lose your salvation. We just covered one here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. But there's also one in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, that says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So faith and keeping the commandments. Faith and works. Mm -hmm. Are you called to keep the commandments? No. Nope. No, we're no longer, Paul says you're no longer under the law. But then he says, should, being that we're no longer under the law, should we go ahead and sin? No. He said, God forbid. You're supposed to do right. Do right. So uh, <clears throat> you can also see it in Revelation chapter 22. Some folks say, preach, why do you go through all this? Because someday somebody's going to take a Bible and show you where you can lose your salvation. Someday they may take Bibles away. And so Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. 
Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. That tells you right there, it's not a Christian. I don't need the tree of life. Nope. I got the, I got the bread of life. I got Jesus Christ. Amen? Yep. So, uh, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. What city? New Jerusalem. The Jews. Amen? So there's some folks that can lose their <coughs> salvation. So let's go back. We we're talking about uh, dispensational truth. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit of God could come into a man. When he comes into you, you're sealed. Amen? In the Old Testament, he could come into a man and he could leave the man such as the case of King Saul. King Saul had the Holy Spirit when God had him anointed king. And there come a point in time when Saul's disobedience, God said, I'm leaving you. I'm done with you. And he sent Samuel to tell King Saul, God's going to take the kingdom away from you. And so the Holy Spirit left King Saul. Also, the Holy Spirit could come into a man and stay with him, as in the case with King David. King David had the Holy Spirit of God. He sinned with Bathsheba. He should have lost the Holy Spirit of God, but he prayed unto God, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And God listened to that prayer. And he didn't take the Holy Spirit away from David. His sins were forgiven. And so, now listen, that doesn't mean there wasn't a price tag to his sin. Was there a price tag to his sin? Yep, his child died. Well, there was more of a price tag than this ad. He had his child died, and then his other son rose up in, 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 uh, um, in, to take the kingdom away from him and... and put up a tent up on top of the house and went in to David's concubines and had a marriage relationship with all of David's concubines that were left behind yep. in front of everybody because when uh, Nathan the prophet went and told David about his sin, he said this he tried to do in secret, but you, the same thing's going to happen to you, but it's be in the eyes of everybody. And that's exactly what came to pass. Amen. So finally, the Holy Spirit could come into a man, leave the man, and then come back into the man, such as the case with uh, Samson. Samson had the Holy Spirit of God. They'd try and take him, and they'd try and kill him. And, and that one time, he, he, they were waiting with arrows, and he put the door jam and the door on his back and took off. And as they're shooting arrows, they're just going into the door. They're not hurting Samson at all because he had the Holy Spirit of God. He had the power of God. And God told him where his power lied. It lied in his long hair. Amen. And then here comes Delilah, and she tricks him, and he eventually tells her the truth, and his hair gets cut off, and he loses the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible said when, when they came in to get him, he shook himself as he did in times past, thinking that his strength would come to him like it did in the past, and it wasn't there. It wasn't there. And the sad part is you see Samson-like preachers all over the country today. At one time, they have power in their preaching. You know, we, we talk about Billy Graham at one time from that documentary, and we heard from his own mouth how he didn't talk like a saved man. He talked like a lost man. Yet in his early days, man, that guy preached with the power of God. And folks were getting saved left and right under his preaching. I'm not throwing a rock at him. Crud, he's probably led ten times the amount of souls to Christ that I have. But he didn't end well. He didn't end. He got liberal. He denied that there was a physical hell. And that's denying the Bible. Amen? So uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of preachers out there that are... What's that? He didn't lose his salvation because he's in the church age. If he was saved, maybe he never was. I don't know. I don't have the right to judge his heart. Now, so, Because I said if he was saved, someone's going to leave here and say, our preacher said Billy Graham wasn't saved. I didn't say that. I don't have the right to judge his heart. He was or he wasn't. But he was out of the will of God at the end of his life. Amen? When you start saying that there's not a literal hell, when God says there is a literal hell, you're preaching against God. Yeah, but there are a lot of preachers today that preach against God. Amen. That's what my whole point, brother. There's a lot of Samson-like preachers out there today. They may have had the power of the Holy Spirit. What's that? Are they saved then? If they are, there they are. I can't say that they're not saved. Just because they... they don't preach in the power of the Holy Spirit anymore doesn't mean that they're lost because they can't lose their salvation. If they truly got saved, listen, I can backslide. I have backslidden before. There was a 10-year period where I didn't do any preaching. The question isn't whether you backslide or not. The question is, do you get up and dust yourself off and get back to work? 
It's not how the middle of the fight is. It's how the end of the fight is in my estimation. But you know what? The, the, the 10 years that I didn't preach, I can never get that time back. It's gone. And then when I go to the judgment seat of Christ and he shows me the, the rewards I could have earned, I'm sure he's going to show me some of the rewards I could have earned during that 10-year period if I'd have stayed faithful. And I'm going to cry bitter tears that I wasn't, not because I didn't get something, but because I let my Lord and Savior down. And so you can let your Lord and Savior down and still be saved. And so... Um, <clears throat> So here's some other verses that teach you can lose your salvation. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, look at uh, verse 13. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So that goes to your question, John. If they have to endure to the end or, they don't, or they're not saved. Well, Matthew's not a... Uh, gospel to the church age Christian. <laughs> Matthew's a gospel to the tribulation Jew. And so look at Matthew uh, chapter 24, four, drop down to verse 50 and 51. It says, The Lord of that servant shall come in the day when he looketh not for him, and in the hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's somebody that was following the Lord that when the master came back, they weren't doing what they were supposed to do and they get cut off. Yeah. It's a tribulation Jew. It's a tribulation Jew. Look at Matthew chapter 25 and verse 30. It says, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there shall be it doesn't say where. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That was a servant. But he was unprofitable. And he says, cast him out into outer darkness. That's somebody losing their salvation. Somebody that was with the Lord, but they're not anymore. Because they became unprofitable. It's a tribulation Jew. Matthew is written to the tribulation Jew. And so, uh, <clears throat> anybody teach that these verses apply to the church age Christian is a false prophet. Our memory verse. Matthew 25 definitely teaches that some people are getting saved by works and you have some people who are lost because they don't have the works. That's what it's teaching. But it's talking in a tribulation context. And it's talking about a tribulation Jew. And uh, Matthew 25, if you go through the whole thing, Matthew, the book of Matthew, you know what it always says? Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven. What's the kingdom of heaven? Physical. It's physical. It's the millennial reign of Christ on earth. Amen? <clears throat> What's salvation? Kingdom of, God. kingdom of God. When you say kingdom of God, it's church age salvation. When you see kingdom of heaven, it is a millennial reign. And the so... Jews, the Jews were looking for a militant Messiah. Amen. Amen. That's why they missed him as when he came to, to give his life for their sins. Amen. So, in the church age, when you get saved, you get spiritually circumcised. You see that in Colossians chapter 2. You get born again. You see that in John chapter 3. You get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You see that in John chapter 14. You get sealed by the Holy Spirit. You see that in Ephesians chapter 4. Notice these are all Pauline epistles. You get put into Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You get baptized by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4. You get baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible does not ascribe these gifts to any other dispensation. None of the other ones get all that. I'm telling you, we were born in the best time period that, that, that you could be born in. God. We get to be the bride of Christ. Amen. We're part of Christ. Amen. As a Christian, if you're not saved, you're, none of this applies to you. But if you are, so <clears throat> you know who didn't get this? These gifts? Noah. He was saved by water. Amen. He didn't get none of this. You know who else didn't get it? David. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 
or Samson, none of them got those gifts. None of them got those things. It was a different dispensation. Different dispensation. So, um, you know, Hebrews is the same thing. Hebrews uh, was written to a tribulation Jew. Wasn't written to a church age um, saint. There's a verse in Hebrews. I, I didn't put it down. I should have. But there's a verse in Hebrews that says, laying aside the simplicity of Christ. What do you mean laying it aside? It is right in the beginning. Laying it aside? That's the foundation of our hope. Well, it's not talking to us. The book of James says, you know, the book of James has that verse that says, faith without works is dead. Guess what? I want everybody to listen to this. Faith without works is dead. That's a true statement. But James goes on to say, you say you're saved by faith, I'm saved by my works. I'll prove my faith by my works. Amen. Who is James written to? Well, James tells you who is the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Is that your mail? What tribe do you belong to? <laughs> you say, so pastor, I'm a little confused by all this. Are you saying we should just throw all that Bible out, James and Hebrews and Matthew? No, no, you don't throw that out. You don't throw any of it out. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> you should be very familiar with this passage of Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going back and forth from it. 2 Timothy 3, um, 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It doesn't say all Pauline epistles were given by inspiration of God. The whole book was. You don't throw out Hebrews. You don't throw out James. You don't throw out Matthew. There's things we can learn from them. There's things that can instruct us. There's things that can correct us. Because you know what? If God didn't want you to kill in the Old Testament, he doesn't want you to kill in the New Testament. He doesn't want you to kill in the tribulation. If God wanted you to honor your father and your mother in the Old Testament, he wants you to honor your father and mother in the New Testament. He wants you to honor your father and mother in the tribulation. You say, Pastor, you don't get it. My father and my mother aren't worth honoring. You're supposed to honor your father and your mother. If God didn't want you bowing down to images in the Old Testament, he doesn't want you bowing down to images even if they call them aids to worship in the New Testament. He doesn't want you bowing down to images in the tribulation. God doesn't change. So why did God give the law? He gave the law not because, you know what, it's not that man became a sinner when the law was given. Man was already a sinner. They just didn't see themselves as sinners. So God gave them the law as a schoolmaster to teach them how nasty they were. Amen. Because Amen. they were already nasty. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable. You don't throw any of it out. You don't say that was an appalling epistle so we ignore it. No, you learn from it. James has some of the best lessons in it. You know what James talks about? Nobody's looking at me. This isn't right here. Oh. James talks about the tongue. Talks about what a nasty little member that is and how no man can tame it. How many of you have said in the last week something you wished you hadn't said? How many have said in the last five hours something they wished they hadn't said? We can't tame the stupid thing. I wish we could, but we can't. And the Bible says we can't. <coughs> Doesn't mean we can't try. We're supposed to try. We're supposed to, that, and therein lies the rub. We're supposed to. Listen, you can't just throw up your hands and say, well, I'm just a no good sinner, so it don't matter. I'll just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow I die. No, tomorrow you're going to go face the Lord when you do die, and you're going to have to give an account for this life. And so learn from the book of James. Learn from the book of Hebrews. Learn from the book of Matthew. Learn. But understand that when it starts talking about being cast into outer darkness, it's not talking about you if you're a born-again Christian. 
You can't be caught, cast into outer darkness. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. And so... How many times are you going to put Jesus on the cross? Well, there's religions that do it every Saturday and Sunday. Every single one. Because when they do their Holy Communion, they're teaching that they're, they're uh, sacrificing Christ anew for your sins. And Christ died once Amen. for the sins of mankind. Amen. So... We're going to stop. We're done with Revelation chapter 12. We're going to pick up with Revelation chapter 13 next week. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for your word. God, what a blessing it is to know that we're saved. What a blessing it is to know that we aren't going to be able to lose our salvation, God. Lord, help us to live right. We shouldn't be boastful because we can't lose our salvation. That's a gift from you. And that should make us love you more and should make us want to serve you better. And God, we pray that it would help us to do just that. I pray, Lord, as we interact with people in this community, we'd see them as either lost souls, that we'd see them as souls that are either going to heaven or going to hell. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us the courage to speak to them and to talk to them about their condition and trying to encourage them to accept you as their Savior.